So it is Super Bowl weekend. It's going to be a tough game. It's going to be a tough game, but I am still hopeful that the Houston Texans will be victorious today. <laughs> it may come down to the final seconds, but I, I believe that we have the talent on our side. Do you believe that we have the talent? Amen. I mean, we got some great players on our team, so we got the talent, but it's not going to happen. Texans have 0% chance of winning today. Why? Because they aren't in the game. Which leads me to say, you can have the right people, but if you're not in the right place, you're not going to win. I'm already preaching. You can have the right people, but if you're not in the right place, you're not going to win. That's what I want to talk to you about today. Not going to lie, sometimes marriage is complicated. Ephesians says it this way. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife. The two will become one flesh. This is a what? But I'm talking about Christ and the church. So today what I want to have happen, Lord, make it happen, is I want to make sure that we get our attitudes and our thoughts and our minds in the right place to where we can be renewed by God so that we can get this relationship thing right. I once heard Andy Stanley say, but this is not verbatim, but something like this. He said, uh, there's a myth out there that says if you find the right person, everything will automatically be right. That's not right. Uh, if you've read The Road Less Traveled, you know that very famous book begins with these three very famous words, a three-word sentence that says life is difficult. And the premise of the book is this, once you understand that life is difficult, then you can move on and get to living your life. The people who are constantly disappointed and disillusioned are those who thought that life is supposed to be all puppy dogs and butterflies and Texans in the Super Bowl. But that's not our reality. Somebody say amen to that. And guess what? The same thing is true in marriage, which is why in this series we've been trying to uncomplicate it. We've been trying to get it down to this, where it is husband and wife and both following God and, and getting closer to God, getting closer to each other. But even when you get it here, you still got to go deeper. You still got to go deeper. And I'm saying today that God wants to do some things in us so that we can understand and go deeper in this abiding, long-lasting covenant friendship of marriage that he had in mind when he invented us in the first place, when he created us. Now, I know that there are people who say, well, I got it down, man. I am so, I'm so committed to God. I just love God. I'm committed to the marriage. I am committed to the marriage. Like, marriage, God made marriage. I'm committed to it. But they don't really like their spouse. Seriously, and you've seen people like this. I am so committed, I'm never going to get a divorce. I'm just going to drive them crazy my whole life until they're dead because I made a commitment to them and I am going to torment them until death do us part. And it's like, really, really, really? That's not what God had in mind. He had in mind that it would be something better, that we would become lifelong friends. Some people call it soulmates. I don't know if that's biblical or not, but that we, we are there for each other. And to get to where we need to, to go requires that something happens in our minds and in our attitudes about this relationship. I want to begin with a passage of Scripture that we're just going to kind of springboard from today. It's Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and it begins with what word? You got it on your listening guide. <laughs> Therefore, and if you've been around church for a while, then you know anytime you see the word therefore, you got to figure out what it is therefore. So what is therefore is what came before it. So, so Paul said something in chapter 11, and then he says, therefore. So you're thinking about what was in chapter 11, therefore, and then we go on with this passage. But what I want to do right now, instead of going forwards, I want to go backward and figure out what he said right before this. This is chapter 11, verses 33 through 36. This is deep stuff here, man. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. And all the people said, Amen. So Paul's putting this into perspective. He's saying, 
It's all the the before the therefore. He's saying God's wisdom and God's knowledge is so deep, man, that you're never going to figure it out. And and you can't search it. You can't even start. Google is not going to help you when it comes to God. And, And not only can you not search it and you can't figure it out, you can't tell. You, there's not one person in church today who could tell God how to do his job better. Like there's not one of us who could give God a helpful hint of how to be better at being God. God has got it, right? And, and he doesn't owe us anything. Again, there's not a person in church today that, that would show up at church and go, well, you know, I've been doing pretty good. God owes me. We don't, no, 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 no. Everything that we have comes from God. Everything in the world is from him. Everything is created through him and for him and for his glory. All that to say, God is large. Hey, 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 hey. Good place for an amen after I get done with this. Okay. God is large and in charge. Amen. All right. You guys are so good. Okay, so that's chapter 11. We're now at the end of chapter 11. Chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, meaning you're thinking about, whoa, how big God is. And that's the God who had mercy on you and me. Wow. Okay. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now, you have heard people say, and perhaps you've said it yourself, we're in a good place right now in our marriage, or or, we're not in a good place right now in our marriage. And that's not what I'm talking about right now. I'm, 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 I'm talking about how are we? Are we in the right place? We're talking about today God transforming our minds and our attitudes to be in the right place so that ultimately our relationships can be in a good place. You with me? You gotta be in the right place here before you can be in a good place in your relationships. It's like, and, and, and sometimes the right place doesn't feel like the right place because we've been in the wrong place for so long. We've been looking at it the wrong way for so long. Um, I was up 5.15 this morning on my uh, stationary bike in my garage. It was cold, it was dark, it was kind of damp in there. I'm in there with the garbage. <laughs> and my garage is not exactly clean right now. And, and the seat especially felt like it was made of stone this morning for some reason. And I am sore all over, don't ask me why, and I have, having an especially puffy day today. And I got my iPad out in front of me. I, you know, I'm trying, I'm trying to fool my, my own mind. So I got an iPad that's in front of me mounted on the front of my exercise bike. And I just turn on YouTube videos of people driving through like Germany and France and everything. And so I'm like <laughs> on my bike, you know. And my eyes are so puffy I could barely see it today. And I'm just right. It just said, I didn't feel like I was in the right place is what I'm saying. But if I want to be in a good place health-wise in the years to come, I was in the right place this morning at 515. You with me? You got to get to the right place so that you can get to a good place. And in your minds, in your attitudes, you got to get to a right place if you want your relationships ultimately to be in a good place. So let's let God work on our attitudes today and our minds. I want to go back to verse 2 and just show you what he juxtaposes here. He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. So that's one side of the equation. Don't do that, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So don't, don't just do what the world does. The, the world just says, hey, follow us. We're going this way. He says, don't do that. And it may feel like the right thing to do since everybody's doing it, but feelings will lie to us. To us. The word of God never lies to us. That's why it's important for us, even though it may not feel like the right place, to let God do the work to renew our minds so that we can understand what the right place is that he has for us so that we can make it to the good place that he wants us to be in all of our relationships. Now, I'm using the acrostic today, friends. Friends. So if you know how to spell the word friends, you've already got the first letter of each blank. And and the reason I'm using friends is because I believe that the best marriages out there, the spouses are friends. In fact, 
good friends, best friends, and, and, and great spouses kind of line up in this area, these attributes, these characteristics of a good relationship and of a good marriage that we're gonna talk about right now, juxtaposed with one another. Here's what I mean by that. Uh, a good biblical marriage and, and a good friendship, they're, they're fruitful, not self-centered. It's fruitful, not self-centered. Meaning, friends make the other one better. So if you're a friend to somebody, you make that friend better. If you're married to someone, you make that person better. Now, I used to have a friend. I think he was a friend. I think he was. But uh, he wasn't, I didn't, he, man. Every time I was around him, I felt like I had to walk on eggs. He would always say cutting remarks, make fun of me for certain things, and act like I was an idiot. And yet, by the time we would leave, he would like give me a hug and say, man, I just love you and love spending time with you. I appreciate your friendship. And I would, I'd be thinking, my mind is like, it didn't feel like friend, friends thing here. But he's saying we're friends, so I guess we are. And then he would leave and <clears throat> want to get back together another time. And we'd get back together and same deal. I've just felt this weirdness, like cognitive dissonance, you know, like it's not matching up. And the, when it really came to a head was after we built the 2 eight campus, and uh, landscaping's in, everything's done, except for we didn't have a container for the dumpsters yet. But I mean, the building's painted, it's brand new, the parking lot's in, striped, everything looks great, brand new trees, landscaping, just looked beautiful, and so he wanted to see it. So he comes to visit, we're out in the parking lot, we get outside the vehicle, we're looking at the building and everything, and I'm thinking, he's gotta say something nice. I mean, this is a, like, like that's the moment. Like if you're gonna have a moment when you actually compliment or give an encouraging word, we're in the moment right now. And, and I just, I was like, here, here it is, brother. And I was expecting, wow, you ought to be proud. Your church family ought to be proud. No, you guys sacrificed, and, but the Lord has helped you guys and it's just amazing to see. I was just thinking, okay, of what some appropriate things would be to say. You know what he said? I kid you not. He stares at everything, then he goes, nice dumpsters. <laughs> it was at that moment I thought, I don't like this guy. And, uh, <laughs> and so I haven't called him since then. It's been like a dozen years ago. I'm like, you know, some, sometimes you, your life gets better when you lose a friend like that. And, um, but my belief is, <laughs> and here he is. Would you welcome him here today? Here is him. <laughs> I'm joking. With you. <laughs> My belief is that friends make each other better. Proverbs chapter 27. The heartfelt counsel of a friend is as sweet as perfume and incense. I'm not in the incense. Smells like soap to me, but you get the point here, right? A friend makes you better. It's a fruitful relationship. And those of you who are married, I'm going to ask you. Do you make your spouse's life better? Do you make it better? I know some of you are thinking, well, they don't make my life better. I'm not talking to them, I'm talking to you. <laughs> and it, actually, let, let me ask you this way. Do they like you? I know they love you because they're married to you, so they have to, they have to love you. But I'm asking, do they like being around you. Listen to me now, life is difficult enough without making things complicated on the very person that you've been called to elevate in this life. Make their lives better. Got to keep moving. Letter R, best friendships are reciprocal, not one-sided. Reciprocal, reciprocal, not one-sided. While it only takes one spouse to be friendly, it takes two to be friends. The pattern of this world says, you know, use relationships, get all you can without considering the other person's needs, watch out for number one, take care of you, all that kind of stuff. And the divorce rate is near 50%, so I'm pretty sure that's not working. In order for us to live and to love as God intended, our relationships need to go both ways. Jesus said it this way in John 13. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. So as I have loved you, as I have loved you, you must love one another. So how did Jesus love us? With exactly what we needed. We were lost. We were looking at an eternity, uh, separated from God. 
And Jesus comes along and says, I love these people. And so he gave his all for us on the cross so that we could have heaven someday and live forever in the presence of Almighty God. He died literally in our place. We're supposed to love others the same way, meaning our love is not supposed to be self-serving. It's not supposed to be for us. It's not supposed to be one-sided. It's for the good of the other person. The problem is we don't all speak the same love language. I mentioned last week or the week before the book Five Love Languages by Dr. Gary Chapman. He has identified these five love languages in the book, and if, if you haven't gotten the book, get the book. It's a good book. Words of affirmation, quality time, receiving gifts, acts of service, physical touch. Every single person in church today probably has a major one of these and then like a secondary one as well. But since opposites attract, rarely do spouses speak the same language, which means we can actually love the other person deeply, but they don't know it because it's like we're speaking Chinese and they're speaking French and I have seen, I've been around couples who love each other. I mean, you take them apart and talk to them, and you're like, man, you guys, is everything okay? I love them with all my heart. I love them. I would do anything for them. Do the same thing. The other one says the same thing, but they don't know it. You put them together, they can't figure it out because they're speaking different languages. It would be like this, just as an example. Let's say the husband, his love language is words of affirmation. So he needs his wife to say like kind things every now and then, whereas she needs acts of service, that she needs some help, okay? And so because he loves this way, he receives loves this way, he tries to love that way. So he's giving her words of affirmation. You are so awesome. Oh, you're great. And she's like, what did you say? Help me. Just help me. Be quiet and help me. And so she's loving him that way, and she's just doing things, and he's like, hey, hey, slow, slow down and say something nice to me. And I mean, it's just like they can't figure it out. And some of you are madly in love with each other, but you're driving each other crazy because they're not facing the truth about the person you're married to. You gotta figure out what language they speak and speak their language. This verse is not on your listening guide, but it's a good one. 1 John 3, 18, dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This is the important part that I want to get to right here, the truth part. <clears throat> John's saying you got to get this right. For those of you who are married, our actions need to match the truth of how God created our spouse. Don't just expect them to love the way that we feel loved. To do so would be one-sided, and that's not what God had in mind. He wants our love to be reciprocal. Next one. The best friendships are intimate, not disagreeable. Intimate, not disagreeable. I'm not talking bedroom intimate. That was last week. I'm talking about having someone who knows us inside and out and they love us anyway. And you knowing someone inside and out, but you love them anyway. Now at first, our differences cause disagreements. But this is, this is the part of marriage that's just awesome. You, you figure it out, man. You, you learn. Okay? Your mind is renewed and you're learning and you learn how to live together even in the disagreements. 1 Peter 3, 7 says, live with your wife according to knowledge. Know your spouse, okay? And then live with them according to that knowledge. My wife and I, as I have said many times, we're very different people, very different people. And uh, yet we love each other very deeply. Uh, 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 for instance would be, she likes it cold at night. She likes it cold when we go to bed. It's like 50 <laughs> degrees, you know? It's like, wow. And I get cold at night sometimes, I do. I, I, I wake up and I feel I'm like having a dream like I'm Leonardo DiCaprio and the Titanic and my face is blue and my lips are blue and I, I'm going down in the water and, and I wake up shivering and I look over at her and she doesn't have a blanket on laying there and I, I don't know this, she says it about me, but I snore like a train, never heard it, never heard it. <laughs> don't know if she's telling the truth. But I snore like a train, she flops around like a fish on the bed all night long. <laughs> she's like, I got restless legs. I'm like, you got a restless body, man. <laughs> but we're so different, and so it takes a while to figure each other out. 
And, and that's just part of the process. You figure out the other person, you learn to live within that knowledge. And so the sleeping thing, for instance, it was, it was tough on us at first because I would keep her up with my snoring and she would keep me up with her flopping and but now, you know, like the, 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 the air thing, I, I use like three quilts every night and she has like a real thin little blanket that she uses and but we're good, we're good with that now. And uh, she wears earplugs so she can't hear me snore. We got one of those mattresses where she can flop all night long. She could river dance and I wouldn't be able to, <laughs> to feel her and she might. She might river dance every night, I don't know. But I'm just saying, we figured it out. Right? We love each other. And so when you love somebody, you just figure it out. You learn to live together according to knowledge. You let God transform your thinking so that you can get into a, a mindset of we love each other, so we're going to work through this. I'm not going to, you know, I, we can't change some of those things about each other, but we can learn to live with each other according to that knowledge. That's being intimate but not disagreeable. Then the next one is the E, enjoyable, not uptight. Enjoyable, not uptight. Now I know that life is serious and serious things happen, but if you're uptight all the time, you're no fun. And so every now and then, every now and then, you just gotta have some fun. You gotta cut loose and have some fun. You say, back that up with the scripture. I could, I'll, we could do a whole sermon, but here's this one verse, Ecclesiastes 9, 9. Enjoy life with your wife, enjoy, okay? Now I know that some people, whenever I say something like have fun and so forth, they're like, hey, 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 I've got a very serious life and a very serious job and the world is a very serious place and you can't be having fun, it's just, it's whatever. I'm just, uh, and maybe you're like, well, we don't have time for fun because we've got important things to do and important things are happening and well, good for you, A, B, have some fun. Okay, uh, back in the day, you remember when we were dating, you could have, you could, uh, you just get in the car and drive and it was fun, right? And you end up at Sonic and you spill something and you laugh and it's just fun, it's just fun being together. But for some reason now, we're like past that. We're, that's not good enough for us. So we gotta get dressed up, we gotta go to this swanky restaurant that's too expensive. And then we go there, we don't have that much fun because the service wasn't what we were expecting. And all of a sudden we're not having even, hey, 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 take it down a notch and just have fun. Like get in your vehicle and go for a drive. Just go for it, I'm, I'm standing on the stage telling you, urging everyone today, lighten up. Just go, just go spend some time together. Just fly down the road, roll down the windows, turn up the radio to some 90s station, you know. No, not 90s. Before that. Um, <laughs> 90s, everybody was in a bad mood. Remember that? <laughs> but uh, end up at some greasy spoon and eat a greasy hamburger. And I know some of you are revolting against that right now. You're like, I will not. My body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. I will not eat a, <laughs> a greasy burger. I ain't going to kill your body. Okay? One greasy hamburger. All right? All uh, right. As long as you don't do it every day. Besides, God made cows. <laughs> I'm just saying, don't be uptight. Don't be so uptight. And maybe you're thinking, well, we used to do things like that. I don't know what happened. I know what happened. You got uptight. You grew up and you got uptight. Just, here's, here's the thing about friends. And you want to be a friend with your spouse, ultimately. Friends can just hang out together. Don't need an agenda. My wife and I, a few years back, it was one of our anniversaries. We just bought tickets to uh, Fort Lauderdale and I rented a convertible and we didn't even have a hotel. We were gonna be there for three days. We didn't have any plans. Didn't have anywhere to stay. <laughs> we, just, we just took off driving just to see what would happen. We ended up down Key West and came back up, stayed along the way somewhere. And, ate wherever we wanted to eat. It was just awesome, man. My head got burned, but it was awesome. <laughs> and I'm just saying, if you're friends, you can enjoy unscripted moments together. In fact, sometimes the unscripted moments are the ones where you can have the most joy. Enjoy your friends, okay? Then the next one, which is the letter N. The best friendships are needed, not unimportant. Needed, not unimportant. We all need friends. 
Even if you're not married, you, you, you still need good friendships in your life. If you are married, your number one friend is supposed to be your spouse. The Bible says this, Genesis 2.18, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. It is not good. And what he's saying is, it's not good for people to, to live in isolation. Again, I'm, and I've said it a few times in this series, you don't have to be married. You don't have to be married to get this right. The apostle Paul was single, and yet he was a mighty morphin power ranger Christian. So he had it going on, but he was single. But the deal with him is that he did not live his life in isolation. He traveled with other people, he was around other people all the time, and if you're single, I'm just saying, please get into a group, get into a life group or something, do life together. Watch out for each other, that's needed. Listen to me, no matter who you are today, you're needed by somebody else. You are. Then the next one, the best friends are, letter D, devoted, not neglectful. Devoted, not neglectful. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 17 says, a friend loves at what? All times, circle that word all. We had a, a devotional in our staff retreat this past week and it was based on a, on a passage of scripture that's not on your listening guide, but I'm gonna share with you. Um, the apostle Paul was talking about things that he had been through in his missionary journeys. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27, he's got this list of things that he'd been through. This is on the list of things. In verse 27, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, watchings, okay? And this may go right past most of us as we're reading this, but if you really look behind what these words mean, it was common back in the day for when groups were traveling that they would take turns staying up all night watching. Because if they didn't, robbers would come and they would steal the belongings of the group or sometimes worse. So this is most likely a reference to Paul laying awake, ready to defend himself and his friends against bandits and robbers on these journeys that they, they took together as a missionary uh, group. According to Paul, he did this often, in watchings often. It was needed, and so Paul did it for his friends, and his friends did it for him. And you, need somebody watching your back. And you need to be watching out for somebody else. Now, when it comes to marriage, I'm just saying there will always be difficult times in marriage. That's the reality of the world that we live in. And that's where devotion is supposed to kick in because a friend loves at all times. So do we have somebody else's back? Do we have our spouse's back? Are we willing to sit up all night in the hospital, for instance? Are you devoted? Okay. One more, and then I want to show you something, okay? So don't leave. Good, good friendships, the best friendships are sanctifying, not degrading. Sanctifying, not degrading. Sanctifying is a spiritual sounding word that means becoming more like Jesus. It's the, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. As we've said in this series, close proximity to another human being makes you better. Close proximity to another human being makes you better. But I'm gonna give you the whole truth right now. Close proximity to another human being makes you better or it will drive you crazy. What's the difference? The difference is here. What's your attitude, okay? Let God transform your attitude and your mind so that you can get to the right place here so that you can get to a good place in your relationship. A good place would be we're there for each other no matter how long God blesses you with life on this earth. That you're there for your spouse. If you're single, that you're there for your friends. That you're always hopeful for them. That you always have their best interests at heart. That you love being around this other person. Okay, um, I wanna show you something here. This is um, a video I saw on the news a while back. Elsie Doyle. Elsie Doyle and her husband Jack had been married for 58 years, 58 years. So this is a, a little short video of them being reunited because Jack has Alzheimer's and he's unable to speak 
Elsie, so he's in a hospital of his own. Elsie has been battling ovarian cancer, but she would still, even with this, uh, her cancer treatments, would still visit Jack on a regular basis. However, four months ago, she fell down and hurt something. I don't know if she broke her hip or what happened to her, but she was hurt, injured, so she's been in the hospital for the past four months. So for the first time in 58 years, they've been apart for a while. And so for, for four months, they haven't been able to see each other, so... Someone went and got Jack and brought him to the hospital to see his wife, Elsie. He's unable to speak, but you can see the smile on his face. He cracks a little bit of a smile. You can tell how much they love each other after all these years. Check this out. Surprise, surprise. Jack. Jack. Well, you locked yourself on now. I can get them both in. Best friends, at all of our campuses, would you please bow with me as we pray. God in heaven, I thank you that even though you are beyond what we can even imagine in terms of raw power and wisdom and uh, creative force, God, that you are still right here in the room with us. Thank you, God. And you're here because you love us. And I pray, God, for anyone at any of our campuses right now who feels distant from you, that the Lord, you would just allow them to sense and to know your presence, to feel your love maybe a little bit more than they have. God, help us to understand that you want to be close to us and you want us to be close to you. I pray, God, for the spouse right now who's struggling in their marriage. I pray that they would have found truth that transforms today, God. I pray for the person who's with us who is uh, single, or maybe single or married, but they're lonely, God. I pray that you would surround them with your love, sanctify them with your truth, I pray that they would become the initiator of deeper friendships with your transforming power, enabling them and getting their heart, their mind, their attitude to the right place. Lord, I thank you for, I thank you for Jesus, for what he did for us, for the fact that he was the best friend that we could ever have to give up himself for us on the cross. And I pray for folks at all of our campuses that if there's someone today that doesn't know Jesus, that's never accepted what he's done for them, that when we're done praying, that they would get to the front of the room and make things right today. Prayer partners will be down here to receive whoever needs you at any campus. You can come down and get prayer today. God, I just pray that you would help us to get to the right place so that we could get to a good place. Pray that you would watch over us this week. Lord, continue to do good things in our lives. Bless us, Lord. We pray all this in your son's name and all the people said. God bless, guys. We'll see you next time.